So Matthew 6, 5 through 15. Oh, look at that. It worked out. <clears throat> and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. I love this. Well, I, I love a lot of scripture. Some of it I don't love. Um, usually the parts that are convicting to me. Um, but this I love because I can kind of put myself on the outside. I love, don't be like the hypocrites. Well, who are the hypocrites? Well, they're the ones that are in the synagogues. They're the ones that are in church. Those are the hypocrites. The ones who are also praying on the street corners and making it known to the world, hey, I love God. I'm talking to God. Why aren't you talking to God? Um, so really, I guess in those kind of descriptions, the hypocrites are all of us to a certain extent. Let's continue. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So there's a few things here, just to clarify real quick. Your Father who sees in secret. Your Father who is in secret. So there's an aspect where, okay, we don't really see him, or the world doesn't see him. We see him. We see him engage with us. And so there's an aspect of, okay, if I can see him, but he's in secret and the world doesn't necessarily know, then there's like a relational aspect to this. Uh, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. That just means people who don't care about God. Uh, <clears throat> this isn't like, you know, I'm not, uh, what's his face from, uh, I can't even remember the movie, but good, good evening, pagans. I'm going to use the quote anyways, even though I can't remember. Anybody? Dan Aykroyd. Thank you. All right. It came to my mind. Um, but it's not that kind of thing of like, oh, as the Gentile, that just people who aren't connected with the Lord. They're not in relationship with him on their end, at least. But the father knows, the father is there. Uh, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So there's an aspect there, well, the father knows you, he knows what you need. So there's a relational thing going on here that, that almost might be the focus. Let's continue. Pray then like this. <clears throat> Or, in some of your translations, it might say, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I put, our heavenly Father, holy is your name. That's another way to think of it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts for trespasses, sins, wrongs, as we also have forgiven our debtors their trespasses, their sins, their wrongs that we feel are against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for... No, that's only in the King James, and that's added, actually. <clears throat> the following verse says, let's continue, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's a very different for than what our brains are used to. And I kind of want to focus on that. Now, uh, real quick, I know I tricked you a little bit there, okay? Uh, that's, that, uh, that's considered a doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Uh, it's great. I have no problem that King James added that, uh, even though scripture says don't add to it. But, you know, people added to it at some point. Uh, obviously, that's how we got the scripture. Uh, and so I'm fine with that. It's a beautiful doxology. It's truth. Uh, so if you say that as part of your prayer, I'm not guilting you uh, in that. Of like, Oh, well, you're not scripture. Or, oh, you read King James. Hey, the best translation of the Bible is whatever translation you will pick up and read. Uh, so please uh, get closer to the Lord. He'll work through it. Um, but there's an aspect, and I, I actually kind of uh, went off for a second uh, with my wife about um, this was just a fresh reminder of how much I do not like 
chapters and verses and uh, titles in our Bibles. Because those headings, those aren't a part of Scripture. Those weren't the inspired part. We add those to kind of like, oh, well, this is what this section's about. And it's like, well, really? Is it? Is it what it's about? Like, because then we have these verses, and then because the prayer is like, it's uh, poetic, so it's kind of set off usually. Jesus is saying the prayer, and then we kind of like stop, oh, well, this is the Lord's prayer, and that's it. Now let's break into a new section. But he says here, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, um, I'm confused, uh, which could be a good place to be with teaching. (laughs) Uh, But there's some passages in the Bible that feel pretty if then and seem kind of harsh and I don't quite understand and so I pray that uh, you would help me with that and if others in this room feel the same I pray that you would help them as well draw us closer to you to help us to love you more and to love each other more in Jesus name amen so uh, my wife uh, the last time I was up here my wife and I taught together uh, and you all responded that it was a good time Um, it was probably mostly because of her. Uh, she's not up here now. Uh, I'm teaching alone, so I don't have her to kind of rein me in. Uh, but one thing that my wife has left me with over the past few years is that I don't make disclaimers anymore. Uh, because I used to make disclaimers all the time. I disclaim everything. Uh, so I don't make disclaimers anymore because she told me to stop doing that. Uh, but what I do give you is context now. So I'm not going to disclaim, but I'm going to give you context. So a couple of things to remember. Uh, One, uh, I'm a youth pastor at heart, okay? So uh, I also am slightly ADD, uh, at least in my tendencies, and have a problem with object permanence, uh, and like to follow bunny trails. Uh, I love them. If you have ever seen Up, the dog with the squirrel thing, that is me, absolutely. Um, I'm also discussion and very relationally oriented. So I might talk with you. Uh, in terms of expecting a response. And you can go ahead and respond if you want. You don't have to. I might just continue on and stuff. Like, so there's no problem. Uh, And I'm also a verbal processor. So again, these are not disclaimers. I'm not apologizing for them, but I am giving you context uh, as to how we go. Um, We're going to put a phrase up in a second, uh, and I'm hoping that it resonates with some of you, and I hope that some of you already know it. Uh, Because if you do and it's fresh in your mind, it means that you love a TV show that my family and I love uh, a whole lot. Well, my wife and I do. Uh, Our kids aren't quite enough old enough yet that we've introduced them to it. But be curious, not judgmental. So, anybody, does that resonate with anyone? You know what I'm talking about? Be curious, not judgmental? No, okay. Well, you guys have a new TV show you can check out here soon. Um, So if there's anything that gets said today... Like, I'm going to be saying a lot of words. If there's anything that you walk away from with, the, walk away with from this time is that I want you to be curious and not judgmental. Okay? So if you're like, oh, man, he said a lot of things. It was confusing, whatever. I, just remember that. Be curious, not judgmental. And it'll actually be up for quite a while. So hopefully it'll burn in your brains. Um, anyone know where this comes from? You're curious? All right, sweet. You want me to tell you? All right, so Ted Lasso is the, if you've ever seen the show Ted Lasso, there's an episode, and it's an epic episode, and I don't really do videos uh, as a part of, because again, not a disclaimer, but context, I'm not Peter. Uh, Peter likes to use videos. I like videos. Uh, I just don't like the effort that it takes to make sure that you have the right clip and put it in and then make sure that it's good for AV and also for copyright issues. Uh, So I just... I'm, I'm, I guess, lazy in that sense. Um, but there's a beautiful scene. You can go to YouTube, look up Ted Lasso, be curious, not judgmental. And it's a few minutes clip of him playing darts and kind of white knighting for this, uh, his boss uh, and telling a story about his life. And it's awesome. And you'll get the context for that. Um, you don't need it for this time this morning, so no worries. 
Uh, but Ted Lasso, uh, and if you've heard it, it's really interesting, uh, and I, I catch this all the time because I actually, C.S. Lewis is a huge uh, fascination and passion of mine, and the Inklings, his whole group. Um, he gets misquoted a lot, or he gets given quotes that he never said a lot. And so Ted Lasso in this scene says, be curious, not judgmental, and he tr attributes it to Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman never said this, okay? He said things like it in much more poetic ways, but he never said, be curious, not judgmental. In fact, actually, the first time that you hear this phrase is in this 1970s uh, um, advice column about a parent who found contraceptives in their teenage daughter's room, okay? <gasps> oh no, contraceptives. Does that scare anybody? In fact, some of you might, well, yeah, some are shaking their heads, yes. Maybe you lived in the 70s. Uh, for those of us who didn't, or at least weren't conscious enough, uh, we're kind of like, yeah, contraceptives. Um, I know that girls can take orthotricycline, uh, and it helps with skin issues. It helps to reduce cramping. Uh, there's medical reasons to actually take hormones and stuff and be regulated in that. Um, there's also an aspect of, well, I know you're going to sleep around, so I guess I'd rather you be protected uh, than that. So there's a certain jadedness that my generation and, and maybe younger has about the word contraceptives. It doesn't strike the same fear. But if, for those of us who haven't lived in the 70s uh, or aren't familiar enough with it, if we could try to put ourselves into this position of contraceptives at this time were not okay, all right, especially coming out of the 50s and 60s, uh, I believe they were illegal uh, up through uh, just recent time, okay, so you, it wasn't a good thing, it wasn't a good stigma, so these parents, they found contraceptives, they're asking, well, what do I do, how do I handle this, and the advice columnist's response was, be curious, not judgmental. Because it's easy to go in and be like, you're doing something I don't understand that I'm scared of that I think is wrong and I'm going to address it with you versus asking the question, what's the question you would ask? Why? Why? Why do you feel like you need contraceptives? Although actually, if we're going to be honest, our why is usually more why are you doing that, right? Like when we ask why these days, there's, there's two common whys these days. The probably under 10 year old, why is why, 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 why? And it's, it's the obnoxious, annoying why that uh, are you really wanting to know the answer or are you just saying that because you know it gets under my skin, which we really know they don't really consciously know that. They're just good at it subconsciously, right? Uh, and then there's the probably above 10-year-old, maybe even above, uh, you know, teenager, why? And that's more the condemnation why. So you have the obnoxious and the condemnation. I think those are the two popular whys. But the curiosity one, I, I think we're encouraged to do that. Like the, the passage in Isaiah where Jesus, or where the Father is inviting uh, Israel, he's inviting Isaiah to come, let us reason together. Like he wants you to reason with him. He wants you to engage in a conversation where you are thinking together and discussing and you're processing. So the invitation to be curious is there. We just need to do it in the right way. So let's take it out of the parental situation because not everybody's parents here. Um, how about somebody swerving on the road? Yeah? You ever been in that situation? Anyone seen somebody swerve on the road? My, my immediate reaction is, well, they're idiots. Uh, any, anyone agree with that? Yeah? Yeah? We have that reaction? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we had one. I, I told my wife, I was like, oh, look, there's like three fresh illustrations this morning for driving. Uh, we get off the exit for federal off of uh, the six, and uh, sorry if I'm not using the right terms, I'm still not a uh, native Colo Coloradan. Wait, is that right? I say Colorado. Is it Colorado? Is that right? Depends on who you ask? Okay, sweet. 
<laughs> I've, got some, I've got some solidarity here. Is that what I'm hearing? All right, sweet. Uh, but we're pulling off, and there's this pickup truck that's turned sideways in one of the lanes. No one's in the car, and there's a police car. Right At first, when I see the police car, I'm like, oh, somebody got pulled over, which then the next question is, what did you do to get pulled over? Because people drive like 15 miles per hour over the speed limit here, uh, and, and, and I'm super judgmental of that. Uh, sorry if that's you. Um, apparently, I'm judgmental of you. Um, but there's an aspect, I'm like, dang, man, like, what did you have to do to get pulled over? And then we get closer, and it's like, oh, this p- pickup truck's turned sideways. What, what kind of an idiot is that? Like, what did they do? You know, and then I get closer, and there's no one in the car. And it's like, oh, it's an abandoned car. And then, I'm, then I start, like, hypothesizing, well, what, what happened here? Like, they swerved, and then they decided to run away, or like, I don't know. And then I, I think, it made me think of this uh, video that I watched where this guy's, like, swerving all around, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's a drunk idiot right there. And then you find out, if I had asked the question, why is he swerving? Not in a judgmental way, but curiosity. You'd find out, oh, actually he's diabetic and his levels dropped to where he got delirious and then he started swerving and needed medical attention. Luckily he got it. Like the video turned out well, like the guy got it. But at the beginning of the video, I'm like, this guy is drunk, he's an idiot, get off the road. You know, when you're diabetic and having that type of situation, yeah, you need to get off the road too, but not in that kind of like judgmental way. So there's, you can see, um, hopefully you're getting the difference here of how we ask the question of why. Well, we're also in church, and this isn't necessarily scriptural either in terms of, it's not like I can say, hey, look up Matthew 5 verse 2, and it says, be curious, not judgmental. So the question then I'm going to ask is, is this biblical? So take a second, when you hear the words, be curious, not judgmental, what passages come to mind? Proverbs, all right. Yeah, there's a proverb that says it's the glory of uh, kings to, what is it? No, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of kings to seek them out. Okay. Sounds good to me. And he's the pastor, so we'll go with it. <laughs> okay. So there's like a, a deeper engagement going on there. It's not just a... Like you picture that first bite, it's kind of to be a very curious... Yeah. <laughs> well, if we're going King James, judge not, <coughs> judge the same meat that you are meated, it shall be meated unto you. Yeah. All right. We're going to follow that trail in a second, uh, again, because I, I like the rabbit trails kind of thing. Uh, I love the thing of like, dude, taste this. It's horrible, you know? And then you're like, oh, my curiosity's peaked. <laughs> like there's, that, that's what came to mind. I'm like, yeah, let's taste and see how bad this really is. But yeah, like especially in the engagement and stuff, and then when you get into the judgment, uh, Romans 2, 1 through 4, therefore you have no excuse, O oh man and women, You're not excused from this either. Uh, Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. The judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O humanity, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead to repentance? And so here's the deal. I judge people who drive 15 miles per hour over the speed limit. I do. Everyone who drives faster than you is crazy, and everyone who drives slower than you is an idiot. Right? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, that's what, if you're not going the same speed and you're not on cruise control and you're not matching with me so that I don't have to slow down when you slow down, and then I don't have to feel like you're about to kill me because you're deciding to drive straight up my backside, then you're doing okay. All right? So if you agree with that, like, that's kind of where we're at. But here's the deal. I drive 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. That's that's the... When I was in Germany for 15 years, I drove the speed limit because that's the rule. 
and they enforce it and they put cameras there to enforce that. And that's what you do. And most people do that, except for the people who are really rich or have the things that tell them where photo radars are. And so then they slow down just before they get flashed by the photo thing. And so, but here's the deal. According to James, I'm going 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. If you break the law at even one point, then you're guilty as a lawbreaker. So I'm not really in a place to put my judgment onto those that drive 15 miles per hour over the speed limit because I break the speed limit as well. Mm. Well, ignoring the beam in your own eye and take the beam out of your own eye so you can see more clearly what is going on. We're almost there. We're almost there. Don't miss the last statement of that passage, though, of the one that we just did in Romans. Not knowing that the kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. A lot of times we put our judgment out to lead people to, rep- and, and usually it's to lead other people to repentance. <laughs> like we judge to lead others to repentance when really we should be trying to work on our own repentance. And I love it in this book called uh, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Uh, there's a statement in there and it says, uh, love the sinner, hate your own sin. And I just love that because I have no control over anybody else's sin. I have a hard enough time dealing with my own issues, let alone me trying to manage the sin of other people. Why would I even try that? So I love people and then I deal with myself. And so there's an aspect of, well, how do I, then how do I encourage repentance? How do I encourage people to turn towards God? Well, the way he encouraged us was through his kindness. And so maybe we should start there. And one of the ways of doing that is by being curious about people and not judgmental. And then we go to Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. Oh, dang it. We're back into the Lord's Prayer again, aren't we? It's us church people. Um, First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It doesn't say here really, though, that you can't judge other people. It's just warning you about what happens when you do. And, And I think a lot of times, especially with, you know, religious words or scripture, we can get into this eternal or salvation mindset, like that it's always, it's always about, well, then heaven, or the kingdom of God later on, or about dealing with issues of salvation, uh, which I really appreciate that for the most part, we don't have too many issues in dealing with that. Like we believe in God's grace, we believe in his mercy, and that he's gonna complete a good work in us. But I don't know about, but I still fall into that. I still hear these words and I still put them either at a later time or for a different thing, but here's the deal. And, and specifically, I think of the passage of um, be careful about being a teacher because you'll be judged more harshly. And that's a paraphrase, okay? <laughs> uh, but people say that it's like, oh, you better be careful about teaching. God's got an extra special measure of judgment for you. And I'm like, well, that's not quite what it says. I mean, I'm sure there's a certain extent of, I mean, God says don't use his name in vain, So there's an aspect of if I am doing something, I'm like, well, God told me to do it, but he didn't really tell me to do it. Then there might be something to, well, God God and I are going to have a conversation later and he might, or sooner, and he might address that with me. So there, there might be something to that. But to be honest, the way that I felt it more is whenever you decide to stand up and say something, and I'm assuming you've experienced this in whatever forums you've been in, either one-on-one relationships, small groups, larger audiences, when you get up and you say something, people are gonna be scrutinizing it and they are gonna judge you for what you say. You're probably doing it right now. Eh, what's this guy gonna say? He looks kind of weird. Like, he's not Peter. I came here to see Peter. Eh, you know, there's certain aspects of like, hey, be careful about being a teacher because you will be judged. And there's an aspect of where it's happening now 
and it, it's going to happen to you. And so even in this instance, like, judge not that you be not judged. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's just later on. If you judge people now, people see that. And if you are an ungracious and unmerciful person with those around you and you're judgmental and you're not curious and you're not seeking understanding, why would people be curious with you? Why would they seek understanding with you? They're probably going to judge you. Yeah. How many times have you had that happen? The, the biggest one is when we go around and raise support, because my family and I, were like, we're missionaries. Uh, when we go to people's houses, it's like, hey, you're a missionary. Why don't you pray for the meal? And then usually our kids out us of like, oh, we don't pray before meals. <laughs> don't, don't tell the people who support us that. And, and then in my mind, I'm like, well, you're a Christian. Why don't you pray for the meal? Like, you know, there's, it, it's that kind of thing of like, you kind of put things out there. It's like, well, you're going to get it back. Um, and then it, it seems like the inverse in this passage is true as well. Like, so if we don't judge others, then will we not be judged? Maybe that's heretical. I don't, I don't know. I think of the woman caught in adultery, that passage, you know, like, the law backed up, uh, and just in case you're not with me, uh, there was a woman who was caught by the, the church leaders, the religious leaders of that time. She was caught sleeping with a man that wasn't her husband. Uh, both of them should have been, according to the law, should have been brought out and stoned. Uh, but they, the leaders only brought the woman out. And they brought her to Jesus. They're trying to trap him. And Jesus, they're, they're asking him like, okay, well, what do we do about her? She was caught in adultery. Uh, law says we can kill her. What do you say? Yeah, the law backed up that the religious leaders could stone the woman for what she was participating in. At that time, they could have killed her. Jesus, however, he didn't give them an answer. He posed a question. He stoked curiosity. All right, he wasn't going to pass a judgment. And I'm paraphrasing, but basically what he said was, do you want to be judged the way that you are judging this woman? If you don't have any sin, go ahead, kill her. Go for it. And the people, what did they do? They dropped their stones and they left because they realized that they are messed up as well. So how do you respond with people that you disagree with? Do you hold on to that stone? Or do you realize, you know what? I maybe don't have everything right. Jesus told, and then in addressing the woman, he, t- she, he told her to come to him and pray a prayer He made sure that she had the correct theology on everything. He baptized her. He told her that he was about to die and come back to life. And then after he ascended and the church was started, that she should join a small group and make sure that she had accountability. You guys remember that in that passage? Yeah, I don't either. Or he simply said to her, hey, no one's condemning you. I'm not going to either. And he could have. He could have. He had the right to. Neither do I. Go and sin no more, which basically it says, there's no need to punish you if no one is making a judgment. Go and live better. Like, his kindness and his mercy afforded her the opportunity to actually turn towards him and choose something better in life than sleeping with someone who she didn't have a committed relationship with and maybe with somebody else's husband, therefore breaking those relationships and being a part of that mess. She could choose something better. Luke 6, 35 to 37, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High and daughters, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Wait, what? Did you hear that? He's kind to the ungrateful and the evil? That can't be right. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. What? 
it's almost like if I don't judge people, I won't be judged. And if I don't condemn people, I won't be condemned. And if I forgive people, I'll be forgiven. And if I go back to the words of Jesus in the Lord's Prayer and follow that verse right afterwards, if I don't forgive people, then I won't be forgiven. What do you do with that? Well, let's see how judgmental I was able to tempt you to be this morning. How many of you are wondering why I'm wearing an anime sweatshirt and a backwards ball cap? Okay. <laughs> um, I do pretty much everything with a purpose, like I said. It's pretty nerve-wracking. Um, I did it to be a stumbling block to you, but not in like, I, I feel like I own it. So if you were wondering in a judgmental way or a condemning way, like, what's this Yahoo looking like up here? It, that's on me. I'll take that. Uh, God can do with me what he will. Um, hopefully, some of you were wondering in a curious way. So, one is, uh, let me give you, again, not some disclaimers, uh, but some context. Uh, I'm a youth pastor at heart. The people that I work with right now in my, my full-time job uh, is recruiting at colleges, so I usually wear ball caps. I'm usually wearing things that try to connect. My kids like anime. So in order to connect with them and relate to them more, I, I, I try to dress like this sometimes. I also grew up in Japan uh, from nine years old to 17 years old. Uh, I grew up in Japan. Uh, probably there was a few years there that I actually thought I was Japanese. Uh, I was confused. It's actually a common trait for what we call third culture kids. Any of you ever heard that term, third culture kids? Um, is this still good? All right, cool. Um, so that's why I was wearing that. Well, mainly to entice you to judgment. Um, maybe this doesn't help as much either. But there is a purpose to this. There's something that Peter says to us at the end of every service during the benediction. And what is it? Believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. This is also a Ted Lasso shirt which this comes into play, right? So I am trying to just make all the dots connect here. Uh, so if you don't like the shirt, no problem. Hopefully you can get behind the spirit of it. Uh, but those are the reasons why I do some of these things. And if you ask me in a curious way, you would find that out. But if you ask it of like, why is he wearing that? Then you shut off and it becomes a judgment. So, why am I hopefully enticing you to judgment and condemnation? To make you feel guilty and ashamed, right? Because that's what we do, right? We spend a lot of our time and effort trying to put guilt on people. And our, we do it to ourselves as well. And we feel shame. But here's the deal. I don't want you to feel guilty at all. I don't want you to feel shame. Uh, but let's talk about guilt real quick. How are we doing on time, actually? This is one of those things. What do you think? It's 11. We normally end about 11.30? What? Yeah, or 11.15. Or 11.15. Oh, and we got worship. All right. All right, sounds good. Um, one thing like Peter, do, I, I do like to say a lot of words, though. So his are more philosophical, and you have to, like, really focus. Mine are just a lot of extra words, like the Gentiles do when they pray. Um, so real quick, there's a couple ways of looking at guilt. One, as a noun. That guilt is the fact of having committed a specified or implied offense or crime. Let me remind you of Romans 8. There is now no condemnation in Christ. There is now no condemnation in Christ. Well, now we just need to figure out who's in Christ, right? That's what a lot of us do. Oh, well, are you a Christian? Oh, do you follow the Lord? Oh, do I follow the Lord? Shoot. How do we know who is in Christ? Well, the parable of the wheat and tares tells us what our stance should be on that. Matthew 13, if you look at that, there's a parable where Jesus basically says, hey, you all suck at being able to discern between what is wheat and what is fake wheat. So don't do it. And then he goes on to explain to the idiots who don't understand what he just said in the story or who need a little extra help like me of, hey, my angels are going to sift and whatever that whole situation is, you don't have to worry about it. So he reinforces the idea, it's not our job to determine what is real wheat and what is not. So we don't have to worry about it. There's now no condemnation in Christ. Well, who's in Christ? Who cares? He's got that figured out. All right? 
And again, the body here, we're pretty solid on our belief on grace and mercy. So we can move forward in that and just offer freedom and uh, freedom from guilt and liberty in that. And really, let me just emphasize this of what our stance should be. 2 Corinthians 5, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If you are choosing to follow the Lord, you are being created, you are being completed. Trust that. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, we are reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. We are ministers of reconciliation. And I'm going to end there, so I don't remember if I have extra slides, Sasha, but don't worry about them. (laughs) Um, The reason why I wanted to talk about this is because Peter gave a message, well, and actually, Uh, I love Ted Lasso, and in fairness, I actually, at one of our supporting churches, uh, spoke a similar message to this. Uh, Theirs was a little more focused on guilt and kind of relieving some of that. Uh, But for here, I wanted to bring this similar message with this because, and, and I actually changed the focus to the forgiveness part because Peter said something that did not sit right with me. And, and I say that what he said was right. I just didn't like it. Um, so he had brought up the concept of if you don't forgive, then the father won't forgive you. And I don't remember exactly how it was said, but that's what came out. Those passages came to mind. And I sat there and I was like, ah, crap. There's people that I don't forgive. And there's like two couples in particular that came to mind, and then a grouping of people. Again, the third culture kid, I didn't go into that too in depth, but if you don't understand, it's basically my parents come from one culture. They're Americans, but my formative years, most of my nine years to 17 years old was in Japan. Okay, so that's a second culture, and I understand or not even understand. I can relate to both cultures, but I'm not accepted by either. I'm a weird American and I'm not a Japanese person, okay? So my catchphrase when I first moved to the States from Japan as a high school student, just graduated, going into college, and my wife can attest to this because we started dating uh, and we spent three years dating and she heard this out of my mouth a lot. Americans are stupid. I used to say that all the time, all the time. And her response, do you want to chime in? What? you're an American. (laughs) You know you're an American, right? And I'm like, whatever. (laughs) But that's like, that's the third culture kid thing. That is, that is the thing. Like, I don't feel American at all. And as much as I'd love to be Japanese, I'm a white guy. Like, I'm the right height, but I'm not a Japanese. Like, I loved it, dude. I was the average height that was awesome. And you could point out all the Americans. They're the tall ones standing out. I'm not. Okay, I'm quiet on a train. I'm the average height. I play video games incessantly. Uh, as a high school student, I just do them moderately now. Um, so there's this aspect of like, I am, there's people that I'm not forgiving. There's groups of people, especially because for me, I hate politics, okay? Don't, uh, don't, don't really try to talk. I'd love to talk scripture. I love to talk relationship. 
I love to talk about what interests you, but if you try to talk politics with me, I'll probably shut down. I'm not at the place where I can be curious yet with that. I'm, I'm pretty judgmental, mostly because a lot of politics has destroyed relationships in my family. And, and I just can't handle it. And I'm not American enough to, re- like, I'll vote if I feel like I need to vote in these areas or for these people and stuff, but I'm not American enough to really care. And so one of the benefits of being a third culture kid, and this is one of the reasons we love working with military people, when you face danger all the time, when you deal with kids who are displaced and don't feel like they have a home, the kingdom of God is very appealing. There is a kingdom greater than America, greater than Japan, greater than any nation in the world. Like the nation of God is really where we belong and it transcends all borders. And we're supposed to hope for that. So anyways, might have been a tangent, but hopefully that gives you a little more insight into the concept of I've got issues with forgiveness. There's people and there's groups of people that I have trouble forgiving. And scripture's pretty clear. And I don't know how this plays out into the, un- oh, that's what you were talking about, the unforgivable sin. You had clarified that at one point. And, and there's, there's an aspect of like, scripture's weird. Like, You go to it and it's like, well, I understand these things about the character of God and what he says here. And then he says some other things. Well, if I don't forgive people, then he's not going to forgive me. That's kind of scary. But he also forgives me when I sin. And so if unforgiveness is a sin, then does he forgive that even though he said he wouldn't forgive? Like, uh, I, I just, okay. I guess the best that I can do is trust God that he's in control. I can continue to be curious about what he's saying and try to reconcile that as best I can in my life. And the things that he's telling me, I should take seriously. So if I don't forgive people, he won't forgive me. At the very least, that should raise my attention to the fact of forgiveness is pretty dang important, right? We need to be forgiving people because we are ministers of reconciliation. And it was not anything that we did. It was because of what he did. And he reconciled us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. So there's an aspect of like, somehow I need to offer that to people. And as much as I have been telling myself this since Peter had said that message and since Susan had backed up exactly what had come to mind, like Peter said something, the spirit convicted me in one of the chairs back there, And then Susan came up after worship and spoke a vision to me that confirmed that whole concept. Like, she said the vision, and I'm like, yep, makes complete sense. And that sucks because now I have confirmation about the fact that I'm an unforgiving person and I need to deal with that. And the problem is, is that I, when I think about those people, I'm still unforgiving. And I don't know what to do with that. Except I guess I do. And I need to be curious and not judgmental. Because really when I think about it, the things that lead me to that unforgiveness is that they judged me. And so I want them to experience the pain that I felt and the lack of understanding and the lack of forgiveness from them. And I want them to experience that. So they know what it feels like. And I don't want to be curious about, well, why did you do that? Why did that lead you to treat me that way? Like, Where does that come from? I don't want to get to know them. I don't want to get to understand why they did what they, I just want them to experience the pain that I did, if I'm honest, which I think I am because I just (laughs) said those things out loud. Um, So I invite you to ask yourself that question. For me, it's not a salvation issue. God's in control. He's a forgiving and merciful God who has said all these wonderful things and we're going through Romans and we're hearing about all of it. But there are these passages that we have to deal with with the seriousness and the heaviness and the weightiness of forgiveness and how important it is. To the point where Jesus will say, if you don't forgive, then my Father won't forgive you. And we have to reconcile that somehow. And I think one of the best ways to start, let's try to be curious. Let's ask questions why, but not out of condemnation, not out of obnoxiousness but out of understanding, out of reasoning, out of getting to know people. Yeah, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we 
need help. And I, I pray that you would, you would be that help for us, that Jesus, you, you showed us the, a wonderful and beautiful way, and I pray that we would live in that. And you ask questions. When you were asked questions, you would answer with questions to incite curiosity and not judgment. And really, actually, to alleviate judgment, the judgment of those who are asking the questions. And so I pray when we feel judged that you would help us to, to stoke curiosity I pray that when we feel angry and unforgiving, that you would help us to be curious. Spirit, Jesus, your spirit, Holy Spirit, please help us in that when we are unable to. And as we move into a time of communion with you, help us to get rid of that forgiveness that ultimately our sin is against you and you alone, as David said. And so let's start there with reconciling with you and repenting and turning towards you. Uh, in the hopes that as we continue to do that daily, that that would translate into the people and relationships around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Anthony. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And he said, take and eat. And in the same manner after supper, and having given thanks, he took the cup, and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, are you curious about this? <laughs> Would you judge this? Because if you judge this, you judge the judgment. But Anthony did raise an awful lot of great questions about this. This is forgiveness. So if we don't forgive, is God's forgiveness dependent upon our forgiveness? Well, that makes sense. And yet Jesus said, if you don't forgive, neither will the Father forgive you. And when did Jesus do this? When did he forgive us? Well, that was at least 2,000 years ago, right? And yet the book of Revelation says that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So the forgiveness happened even before creation happened, which would make sense if God creates everything out of nothing. Everything is uh, forgiven. So how is it that if we don't forgive, we're not forgiven? At the start of the prayer, Anthony, I noticed when you were reading the verse, he said this. Uh, but Anthony asked me to do communion, by the way. But So I'm, think, oh, I'm curious about all this. But at the start of the prayer, he said, when you pray, go into your room. And I thought, well, what if a person doesn't have a room? Well, I think we all have a room. And Scripture says that we're all the sanctuary. That's what we've been, or we're all the temple, right? That's what we've been learning in Romans. And in the depths of the temple, there is this inner room, the inner sanctuary. And uh, this is the, the picture. This whole sacrificial system gets fulfilled here, which is what, it reaches its climax in that inner sanctuary. And in the temple, the inner sanctuary was said to be of the age to come. The outer courts were the ages of this world, and forgiveness was the age to come. So when we come to communion, uh, we come in this building that we call a sanctuary, but what matters is that you come to that inner room in your own heart, and you enter into that sanctuary, and you see that sanctuary is eternal. It's not part of space and time as we experience them. And I think that also means that the grace of God is eternal. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is reality. Forgiveness is uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, forgiveness is just the way it is. Everything is forgiven. You can't pay for anything. And yet we think we can. And so when we live in unforgiveness, we live in the outer darkness. We're not living in reality. And so unforgiveness is the unforgivable sin because unforgiveness is not reality. Unforgiveness is an illusion. And this is the gospel you will forgive. God enters into our darkness. He enters into our chaos. And that's even what a picture of this is. And he reveals to you his forgiveness. And then we jump into forgiveness but if I don't forgive, if I don't, if I don't give the blood, right, if I'm a, a vessel of mercy, like a blood vessel, 
well, then I don't receive the blood. I damn myself. So as you come to the table this morning, um, you undam yourself. You uh, give as it's given to you. You forgive. So uh, in a moment, Anthony is going to begin to lead in worship. But as you come to the table, um, do that, would you? In fact, right now, maybe we can, can we just pray that right, real quick before the, we come to the table? Um, just close your eyes and say, Lord, is there someone that I need to forgive? Now, you may have told yourself that you can't forgive them. But that's just not true. All of reality is forgiven you. It's all given to you by the Father. In fact, you can even lose your life and you'll find it. Because you offer, as you offer, if you offer the life, more life is given to you because it all comes from the Father. So you can forgive because you are eternally forgiven. So in your heart, say, in the name of Jesus, I forgive, and you forgive that person. And forgiving that person is waking up from a dream that has become a nightmare, which is your ego, <laughs> the illusion that you are your own creator, and you're not. That's good news. So believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. God is holy, and we in and of ourselves are not. But because of what he did and because of who he calls us to be and who he's making us to be, we are holy. We are ministers of reconciliation. We are forgiving people. And so I encourage you to be forgiving, to live in that reality. That when faced with unforgiveness, when faced with confusion, when faced with judgment, that we would enter a place of being curious, that we know where we stand with God, and if we don't, maybe that we're moving towards that, and that we live in the fact that we are beloved children of God, that we are chosen by Him, all of us, and that because He chose us, we can have the freedom to engage with everyone as if they are. And we don't have to be threatened or worried or feel judged because it doesn't matter. It's the Father that matters. It's Jesus that matters. It's the Spirit that matters. And so we can offer understanding. We can offer curiosity. We can offer forgiveness, and we can take judgment out. And so I encourage you to believe the gospel. Believe that you are chosen children of God, and go help others believe that as well. So please do that. Believe in yourself. Believe in God <laughs> and what he has for yourself and help those around you believe that as well. Um, I think we have time hanging out. You said there's pizza. Is that right? I heard pizza. I heard there's pizza. Yeah. I uh, said you're going to do prayer. All right, sweet. If you want prayer, come up. Uh, and I encourage you to, to live in that as well. Uh, I don't know how often people come up for prayer. Maybe you don't have time, whatever it is, but I encourage you, man, can always use some. And today, maybe it's like, yeah, I've got someone that I need help forgiving, and I just can't live in that reality. Well, come, come get prayer for it. Come live as a forgiven child and, and get prayer from another forgiven child, and, and hopefully you offer that. Eventually, you can let that go and live in that reality. So, go and believe. Oh, yeah, we were going to